Florida Republican Ron DeSantis, biggest donor is Robert Bigelow, a billionaire with a passion for UFOs. Not only is Bigelow supporting DeSantis, but along with spending over 50 million to support other Republicans. What happens when the UAP topic becomes political? And will candidates exploit the UAP narrative for their own personal gain? Dr. Gary Nolan, entrepreneur, inventor, and a University of Stanford professor in pathology, joins me to discuss his thoughts around the UAP topic going political, along with his work on finding physical evidence of an area in the brain where an individual's intuitive capabilities could potentially be located. Join us as we get rebelliously curious. Gary. Thank you so much for joining me on Rebelliously Curious today. It is an honor to speak with you. Well, it's great to, to be here and to talk yes. to your listeners. Yes, for sure. Uh, I want to start off just a little bit about your childhood. You know, we'll, we're not going to go totally in depth with it, but we'll talk a little bit about it. I know that you, from what I've read and what I've seen, you've had three different experiences in your life around the phenomenon, starting at a really, really early age. Can you just shed some light on those if people don't know what those experiences were and then, you know, how it brought you into researching the phenomenon to, to today? Well, it was at a house that my parents had first uh, bought when uh, after we moved here to the states. If you remember, at 35 Craig's Road, Windsor, Connecticut. You can look it up. I looked it up actually a few weeks ago, and on Google, and it's still there. Um, and it was basically little guys in the bedroom. And uh, I remember calling out to my brother uh, and saying, "You know, is that you?" And I, then I didn't understand how it could be like two or three of him, uh, and then faces in the window and things like that. And I mean, other than just memories of them being in the room and, and being a little scared, uh, and then I guess falling asleep, uh, there really was, really was nothing uh, uh, at that time. It was interesting. It wasn't until actually almost 30 years later that I found out from my brother that he had also seen things. Um, and so uh, that was um, quite a, a synchronous or a synchronicity, eventually 30 years apart. Um, and then at our second house uh, in on Sheffield Drive, yeah, Sheffield Drive, also in Windsor, I, w w I was a paper boy and going between one house and another early in the morning, uh, I saw something over my head. I mean, it wasn't just like far over my head. It was like 30, 40 feet just at the top of the trees. And it was, I, I can't say that it was exactly saucer shaped because I, all I saw really were the lights and kind of a vague outline against the sky because the lights were so bright. Um, and, but it was, I didn't know what it was. I mean, I saw it go over. Um, it was silent. Uh, you know, I mean, the, at best it could have been a balloon. Um, but I don't know any balloons that are traveling at tree height, uh, you know, um, with lights underneath them. Uh, and, uh, and then I guess many years later in, uh, the first house that I bought, or no, sorry, we were renting actually, when I came out as a professor at Stanford an assistant professor, something in the, in the bedroom as well at the bottom of the bed. Uh, that actually was the first time that I ever heard anything inside of my head kind of like speak to me. It basically says, when I saw it, it just said, go to sleep. And that was it. I, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't afraid, but I remember being frozen. Um, and, uh, and, and really, you know, that was it in terms of encounters. I mean, there was something in London many years later it must have been about maybe only like five to 10 years ago. Um, but that's a, that, that was a different incident altogether. I don't want to bore your, your listeners. No, I'm like, I would love to know. <laughs> I don't think that's boring at all. I think it's actually fascinating. Has anything like, is, did you have any contact? I know that you said you saw them, but they did anything I, ever touch you? No, no. I mean, 
I mean, if there was, I don't remember it. Uh, and, you know, it, it wasn't until actually I was a graduate student um, here at Stanford. Uh, I was in a used bookstore and uh, one second, I'm sorry. I got to turn that. Uh, I was in a, a used bookstore uh, and buying um, science fiction books. And I came across a book. Uh, there was two of them that I came across. One was by John Mack and the other was by Whitley Stryber. And I remember just seeing the cover and realizing that was the face that I had seen when I was a kid looking through the window or in the bedroom. Um, you know, and the thing about the window was it was like six feet off the six or seven feet off the ground. So it wasn't like some short person. So whatever it was, was kind of like if it was what it was, about, there's something very tall or hovering. Um, and it was uh, I remember just all the skin on my body, like st all the hair stood on end when I saw it and I dropped the book because it was like, how does this guy know what I saw? Um, and I knew nothing about the whole UFO arena. I mean, I read science fiction, but I'd never read about, you know, alien abductions or any of that kind of stuff. Right. And then we fast forward later on in your life and you're working at Stanford and you start researching and working with other people around the phenomenon. You know, I, I'd like to get into the work that you've done on the brain because I, I think it's it is amazing. It's just so fascinating. I, again, am not a scientist or any form <laughs> worked in any medicine. So I probably will butcher these words, but, uh, the cotty potato, I believe in, and the basal ganglia. So those are two areas that you were researching within the core of the brain. And we found out later on that there was experiencers and I love first, you know what, let's just do this first. Can you explain what those two areas of the brain are? So people have an idea of what they are and then how it ended up, you know, connecting to the phenomenon, the research you did there. And then we'll get into uh, some other questions after that. Yeah. So actually the, you, the basal ganglia there, you have two of them, one on each side of the brain. Um, and they're pretty complex. Uh, they're almost like their own self-contained unit inside of the brain. Um, the caudate pitamen is actually within the basal ganglia. It's part of the basal ganglia. Now, the word basal means the basement, the, the center. Ganglia are like neurons and, and things. And there's multiple uh, um, neuronal complexes within there. Um, and there's the caudate and pitamen. Now, the whole uh, basal ganglia, caudate, caudate pitamen complex uh, for almost 20, 30 years he uh, was thought to be only involved in motor control. Uh, damage to that area of the brain had showed uh, that it was uh, involved in motor control. And then as uh, you know, the questions got more, um, let's say implicit, you know, so motor control, output or input. And so people found out that it was both output and input. Input means sensor. Right, that the, the the sensory network of how and where you're going to move your arms or your legs depends upon knowing what you expect it, your arms or legs will meet when they move there. Right, so uh, you know when I go to grab something, that isn't just motor control to grab this cup. It is the knowledge that my hands, when they reach and touch it, have achieved the goal, and I do it. Now, to do that though, there's all kinds of planning steps that need to be done to move each of the articulations of my arm and muscles all subconsciously to what I'm going to be doing. And I often use the, the example of you're at a party, you're walking across a room towards the bar, you're avoiding this person because you don't like them. You're trying to get to that person maybe because you like him or her. The waiter is about to drop something. So you're, you're unconsciously stepping aside all of those things are actually planned in the basal ganglia. They are the total sensory input of your emotions, your needs. The emotions are like, I don't like that person. I like that person. So all inside of your brain subconsciously, the planning is going on as to where and how you're going to move. Interesting. Um, and so it was understood over the years that this area was involved not just in motor control, but in all the sub goal planning steps 
downstream of your desires, your executive function in your, what you think of is in your head as who you are. Um, but it's all going on unconsciously. But it turns out fascinatingly that this area of the brain is also where um, intuition happens. Now th think of it this way, in evolution, our, your motor control and desires uh, have to be literally split second. It can be the difference between being eaten by the jaguar or not. Uh, and being eaten by the jaguar is you didn't move fast enough, you didn't intuit something, you didn't hear something or know something subconsciously that um, uh, this rustling might mean something, I better prepare for something. So it, it's interesting that from an evolutionary standpoint, those expectation management steps are nearly perfectly aligned with what you would think of as anticipation or even a form of paranormal anticipation, prescience, the knowledge that something is about to happen and preparing the body to deal with it before it happens. Uh, you know, this would, it would be the perfect place for it to be. Right. Some studies have been done. These are now like regular fMRI, functional MRI, which basically read the areas of the brain that light up when the when the brain is active. It's using sugar, um, and that you can read that with certain kinds of um, chemicals injected. Uh, so they were um, is a form of Japanese chess, and um, it's sort of a simpler form of chess, but it's still quite difficult. And uh, so they had experts training uh, on this. And basically what they, the, the, the sum of what they noticed was that when the individual makes an unexpectedly brilliant move, the kind of move that you wouldn't, isn't just sort of like tic-tac-toe obvious, that area of the brain, the caudate patamen lights up, the caudate lights up. Um, and so there's numerous studies since then that have, including some from uh, the work that I've been doing with a group at Harvard, that basically draw your attention to the caudate and patamen as being uh, the place where intuition and complex decisions are made. Uh, in, in fact, it, it's actually called this whole area, the, it's called the brain within the brain. Uh, it's the place that does the pro a lot of the of what we think of as higher order processing in that little teeny nub, probably half the size of a fist on each side of your brain. Um, so uh, that area of the brain is what we had noticed in the studies that I have done with the brain scans uh, on the, the military and intelligence personnel. Um, you know, they had, I'd been brought a number of individuals and in case studies uh, for people who had encountered things. Um, and it ended up being everything from Havana syndrome to actual UFOs. The Havana syndrome are less interesting because they're sort of real world problems. Um, and, uh, but it was sort of a, it, it, it was one of those examples of the, of, of, of the beauty of collecting raw data uh, and looking for something interesting. So because we had just been collecting this data, we found this area of the brain that it doesn't mean that this area of the brain was involved in UFOs. It meant that this area of the brain and the commonality of what we saw, this increased neural density across these individuals was actually correlated to higher function in these individuals. So if you, if you had a common intellectual feature across all these individuals, they were either savants, highly trained CEOs of companies, et cetera, um, which basically kind of made sense that this area of the brain, intuition, you know, the ability to manage expectations, to see expectations, um, was, uh, was overdeveloped. At, at one level, no surprise. The big surprise came when we looked in the families, we were looking for controls. We call them controls. You basically say, is there something about the environment or, or you know, an upbringing? And you would expect that, let's say, uh, the wife or the husband of the individual, the, the index case, as we would call them, 
uh, would not have it because they didn't grow up in the same situation. Whereas what we found was in uh, of the two couples where we happened to have both the MRIs, both of those individuals had the feature. Now, we had looked in uh, probably about 100 or so normal individuals out of MRI databases that are all uh, cleaned of names and, and you know, um, identifying information. And our best estimate is that this feature is in about one in 100 or one in 200 individuals. Wow. So, so the fact that out of a group of 20 individuals, two of those individuals had husbands or wives who also had it was remarkable because the numbers don't compute, right? It's, it's basically the, the ability of two people to come together is, you know, one in, let's say, 100 times one in 100, which is 10,000. Right. And then the ability of those of two groups of those to come together is 10,000 times 10,000. Right. It's 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 low is the is the chance. And then we looked in a couple of them where we had families and the children had it. So, I mean, you know, as a I, my Ph.D. is in genetics uh, and doesn't need to be a geneticist to realize oh, this is running in families. Uh, and, uh, it's kind of like if you had, uh, you know, blonde children, uh, and you were both brunettes or black haired, you might think there's something genetic going on here. Um, so what excited me about that was, okay, well, if you have two individuals who together are finding each other and they both have it, are, are they being drawn to each other? Are they seeking out others of high function? Yeah, that kind of makes sense. I mean, you kind of, you know, people tend to like to marry into their intellectual equals. Uh, and um, so that makes sense. But what I found fascinating about that, and people are going to claim I'm a eugenicist and all kinds of stuff, but I'm going to say it anyway, uh, is that it, it implies that you are starting to see a um, a, a kind of the, the beginnings of a of a breeding group separation of one group that will breed only with itself, which over time, you know, if 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 there is no intermixing across those groups, which of course in society there still is, um, you're going to get uh, further and further separation until basically, you know, 100,000 years from now, if it kept going, uh, you'd basically have two different races. And I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, people are going to say all kinds of horrible things about me. I'm, I'm not a eugenicist or anything. No, I, I think you're looking at, and I was, you're actually bridging beautifully into a question that I was going to ask you about neurodiversity because mm -hmm. neurodiversity kind of plays in the same elements here, right? Mm -hmm. We see that as we grow, we look at people that have neurodivergent brains and neurotypical brains, right? Mm -hmm. So majority of the time, it's funny enough, I surround myself with a lot of people that are probably neuro that I know are neurodivergent now or found out they have ADHD or they're dyslexic. I don't know if I'm technically neurodivergent or have a neurotypical brain. I think I do a mix of certain things, but when I'm analyzing myself, but I surround myself with a lot of people that are neurodivergent. So there has to be something to that. Have you looked at neurodiversity in relation to the phenomenon in the, in everything that you're doing and collecting data around the cotypotainment and the basal gang ganglia and looking at intuition, because it sounds very similar to the concept mm -hmm. of neurodiversity and what you were saying about people grouping. We noticed that people group together. And that's what I was saying about myself before we notice that people group around their neurodiversity because they feel comfortable and they can communicate and they're understood by their right. peers because they think very similarly. Right. It doesn't mean that happens all the time, but there is, um, you know, we're seeing that. We're also seeing it in the workplace now too, where being neurodivergent is actually being more, way more accepted than it would be before and understood and also welcome that we need more neurodiversity in it. So I do think that there's something there and it's not saying that, you know, eugenics or anything like that, it's just an observation. But right. have you looked at neurodiversity in relation to the work that you're doing and then attached to the phenomenon? So we're, we're doing 
essentially what you're asking the reverse way is by we're establishing a database of what is normal. All right. Uh, and so what you do with that is, you know, before you can look at divergent uh, or abnormal, you have to know what normal is because that's the comparator group against which you're, you know, comparing the so-called divergence. Um, so what we did with this group at Harvard was we set up uh, a study, uh, a retrospective study uh, looking backwards. It's called, it's thinking looking backwards rather than collecting the data ahead of time by choosing who you want to look at. We basically went to two databases, a German database and a British database of uh, everything from people with schizophrenia to normals, age matched uh, and sex matched and autistics. Uh, and so, and they had also um, scores associated with them, intelligence scores, emotional scores, et cetera. And so uh, the, the reason for doing this is that we had the normal groups and then we had two groups then of individuals who, you know, before you come become clinically a problem in autism or schizophrenia, uh, there are, let's say, neurodivergences that on the schizophrenic side are usually thought of as creatives. Uh, and on the autistic side are usually thought of extraordinary focus or abilities in certain arenas of the mind. Everything from, you know, playing music to math and other things. And usually the autism comes with a deficit in social uh, issues, social interaction. And the schizophrenia comes with a, a deficit of real of understanding the difference between reality and fantasy. Uh, and so, I mean, those are very broad and I'm not a psychiatrist, but, you know, I think everybody would, would appreciate the, the, the comparison I'm making there. And so um, we've now published two papers on this peer reviewed. Uh, and the, the primary, the principal thing was to show which areas of the brain were most associated with either intelligence or one or the other of the features, schizophrenia and autism. And uh, as it turns out, the, the caudate and the patamen, especially for intelligence, were at the top of the list in all of the studies that we've done so far. So that uh, comported not only with our initial findings, uh, but also with now that we've dug into the literature, many other uh, laboratories have found essentially the same thing that the caudate patamen is, is central. But we were interested in something a little bit bigger than that. And, and that's the, the network of the brain. I mean, the caudium and patamen don't act by themselves. You know, if you have a super processor in the middle of your brain, if it doesn't have the right wiring to get to the other parts of the brain, then you, it's just sitting and churning noise and not doing anything. So it has to have a receiver or a, or a deliverer on the other side that is capable of either delivering the information or accepting the information that's processed. And of course, then the wiring between has to be capable. So um, you can think of that then essentially as a network. And so by collecting this information from you know, now hundreds of individuals, we can build a network model of which area the brains compensate for one thing or another. And so again, what you're looking at is a sort of a giant sculpture, which is you know, in evolutionary terms, changing and malleable. Uh, and each of those features, if two individuals come together, marry and have children, you know, through genetic recombination, traditional you know, standard genetic recombination of, of making eggs and sperm, uh, then they come together and they mix and match. And then hopefully a new fantastic match will come together that is a, a best of both parents. That's just how evolution works. Uh, so, you know, we, we are seeing everything that we would have expected uh, in terms of the kinds of areas uh, but now we're getting the details because so much was kind of fuzzy, but now we're getting the details. And so the reason why I, I gave that, you know, side discussion on it is because now that we have that data, now I can go and do the questions that you're asking. Now I can say, is there, you know, uh, give me an experiencer 
And I can say, well, is the experiencer more likely or closer to the schizophrenic or the autistic or what have you? Um, where on the spectrum do they lay? Where, where on the spectrum do they exist? Give them a score. And I've even told the two postdocs who did the work, I said, look, you know, you should you should do an online, you should set up an online um, uh, system where keep, people could upload their MRIs completely free of uh, names and all the rest anonymously and ask what their score is, you know, and you could charge some modest fee. I, you know, it's, 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 you're, you're not prescribing anything to them, but it's in some ways no different than an online test you might take for intelligence, but now it's giving you sort of a real world capability. But then, you know, going deeper is with now, what it would be called a prospective study or a larger study, we can actually use it in a purely clinical sense to help people with schizophrenia or with autism to give them sort to begin to break down the various types of these maladies or capabilities, you know, because I want to think in some ways that that people on the spectrum in other direction actually have a capability, There's not just a deficit. Uh, and so I, I think that that is, I mean, so there's that that one side result that we got out of just openly looking at the data from people who'd been damaged came to an extraordinary set of um, opportunities right? That if I had listened to 99% of the scientists out there who would have said, oh, don't even touch this stuff. It's poison. It's a mess. There's nothing here. No. By looking at something like this and seeing the anomaly, paying attention to the anomaly, not being crazy about it, uh, and then doing the science, look at what happens. One of the ways to think about it as uh, if you're if you needed to put anomalous information anywhere, it's going to overlay onto uh, the normal sensory systems, right? There are people, for instance, who claim certain abilities and they see them or they feel the emotion or they hear something. Uh, and that probably relates to whether that person is a more visual or feeling or hearing type of individual. I mean, you and I were just talking earlier about we see shapes. So when I get ideas, sometimes they feel like, you know, other people call them downloads. When I get ideas, they come to my head, both in terms of flashes of insight and shapes and fully laid out scientific plans is the best way to put it. I mean, um, and, or when I, I, I get a sense of something I should or shouldn't do that's, you know, if I do this, I'm going to get hurt. Uh, it comes as a flash or I'm driving down the highway and I think, oh, I have to call my husband. Ten seconds later, he calls. And so w what are those things? But when I get that, it's the, the sense of the getting of that information is different than the sense of when you're planning something, right? When you're thinking out a process uh, as opposed to you're not expecting it, boom, it comes into your mind out of the blue. Uh, and it, I, I call it, I, it seems to have for me a color. There's like a, there's a, there's a sense that it's a different kind of information than the normal information that I'm collecting, right? Then I'm watching you. I mean, I see you, but then I might get a flash and it's like, it's different. And so what I've tried to do, I can't say that I'm good at it. I tried to train myself to recognize those moments because those moments are some kind of, uh, whether they're coming from a paranormal sense or whether they're coming from just some form of natural intuition, they're coming from that place. And I've learned to pay attention to them, whether they're weird or woo or whether they're just real you know information that i'm in the environment that i'm not seeing uh it doesn't matter you recognize that it came from a different place in your brain and right. it's in
And so that I think is, is important. I was reading a book. Um, I wish I had my Kindle here uh, by a woman who writes about this very thing. And she talks about exactly this, that the two parts of the brain, one which collects normal information versus anomalous information, actually the brain cannot coexist in both at the same time. And she relates this a lot to how put offs remote viewing programs where the signal, the moment is what you pay attention to, not your brains, your left brains interpretation of it, where you overlay it with, with potential meaning, which could be misinterpreted meaning, right? So they learned that in the remote viewing program to take the signal and not too much later about that, the so-called overlay, the secondary meanings that the brain uses to try to make sense of something. Right. Then what happens when we start getting into like the architecture of the brain later on, like we get into crispering and other things in the future, are we going to start looking at then potentially enlarging these areas and then creating people literally like almost a super race in its own way, being able to remote do you and do these things? You know, I, I know we should focus on probably the people that are obviously that, that need these areas repaired of their brain or, you know, and, and focusing on certain things like that. But are we going to get into a really, really sticky area where we're looking at CRISPRing, CRISPRing and genetics in the future? Have you heard of anything of that? I mean, I mean, look, the way that it always works is whether, I mean, I'll, I'll use the worst possible wording of this is we always use the people with damage and who need clinical help as the path to discover what is uh, what we can ethically do to a human body, right? right? And that's where you, you say, okay, can I try out a new drug for cancer that I don't really know is going to work? I can use it in a compassionate use case when the person has stage four and they're close to an end. I can try this. I can use a trial drug without a full test. And so, but you can back off a little bit uh, to people who aren't necessarily in dire need, but we, that's always where the ethics are trialed out to make sure that we're doing the right thing. But once you pass that mark, then it starts to become easier to turn and say, okay, well, now I want to use this to make me better. Right. That it's, it's now I'm, I'm making a choice for this interaction. Cosmetic therapy is an exact example of this. Um, so, um, so the, the short answer is yes, we will start doing CRISPR, but on people, but only when the ethicists have decided and religion and politics and policy have decided that it is worth the risk first for individuals who are at great need. So it'll be used for something like thalassemias or blood disorders or uh, things. I mean, I, I, I made the first retroviruses, the, the, the rapid retroviral system. I was involved in the creation of that. It's used in all genetic therapy around the world using retroviruses, the 293 based system. It was my idea, which actually came in a download. Um, Wow. And, um, and uh, I made a lot of money on that. I get a check every year. Uh, and um, so people are doing it, but it began with, with engineering things like T cells for CAR T therapy or other kinds of cell types. Uh, so, but people have not done it for benefit. There was the Chinese individual who tried to use it on the baby for uh, giving the baby resistance to HIV. I mean, that was, a, that was beyond unethical, right, uh, to, to do because, you know, we don't necessarily know uh, what the consequences of that would have been. Um, so it, so it's, it's going to come. But I don't think it's going to come in the next five years. But what will come in between now and then are things like transcranial stimulation, right? Or, you know, Musk's 
neural implants that he's making. I mean, he didn't think that idea up. That idea has been in in science fiction for a long time, um, but it it's been in science fiction for a long time because people think it would be we will be capable of doing it one day, right? And and so yes, I think that there either would be a combination of of drugs and or implants and or modifications that you make um, to an individual to enhance their intellectual capabilities. I have to ask this because you have had experiences. Have you ever measured or done any MRIs on your own brain to see if you're like have a large cardiopatiment or, yes. you know, these, okay. I mean, it sounds like narcissism and it no, is. No, like- no, I, it's, it's not, I don't think that's narcissistic at all. I just think it's, it, if you're having your own work and you're having your own experiences, why wouldn't you do tests on yourself? We mm-hmm. actually did it on the whole, stu- the people who were running the study group as part of the controls. And we were shocked that several of us had it. I then checked my mother, my brother, and my sister. They all have it. And we're, wow. way, we're way off the curve. Um, in many respects, which is, you know, my husband says, well, no wonder, no wonder you're so weird. <laughs> no wonder you're neurodivergent. Exactly. Uh, explains, explains it. Yeah. Explains a lot. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. I, I don't know what it means, but what I'm, what, what I'm interested in it though, for is once we can isolate a group of such people, um, now we can start to do, do the genetics right now I can compare a group and family groups uh, end up being extraordinarily powerful uh, in terms of, you know, my, my brother and my sister might share areas of the genetics that correlate with the changes in the brain that you don't see in other individuals in the normal population, but maybe one of the other groups individuals has it and and that's the the power of numbers suddenly starts rising where you can start to say these are the nucleotides and the genes or the regulatory regions which are all controlling uh the shape of the brain in such a way that it creates a receiver or a functionality that can make better sense of this anomalous information than others. And, you know, I, I think that there's pretty good evidence um, that most people have it, right? If not everybody has it, um, but it's whether you recognize it for what it is, is really the level of what you might call intelligence or awareness, right? That a lot of people can walk into a room and and see, you know, the detective thing that's out of place than not. I have a funny story I haven't told publicly, but I always use this with my, with my friends. So when my husband and I were first going out, he had gone uh, on vacation somewhere. And um, I had, for one reason or another, had a, I had a joint. And he didn't like me smoking, but I occasionally did it like on a Friday night. And so before he came home, I realized that I had left it in the bathroom. So I run upstairs and I pick it up and I put it in a little box on the bureau in the bedroom. So he comes home. I go downstairs. I grab his, his, his uh, bag to help him take him upstairs. We go upstairs. He walks into the room. And he looks around. He walks right over to that box and he opens it up. And he pulls the thing out and he says, what is this? I said, how the F did you know that? He said, I don't know. I just knew there was something about that box. Right. And, and so, I, I mean, it, we laugh about it years later, but what, where did he get that information? It's not like we had cameras in the, in the bedroom or anything. So it's, it's that kind of thing that basically tells me that nearly everybody has it, or in retrospect, I should check his brain. We haven't done it yet. I was just going to um, say that. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, it's, it's, it's like, do you recognize it for what it is? You know, there's that old thing, uh, the, the, you know, the, the psychology, um, uh, 
never I don't know if it's a test or you can you're sitting in in the classroom the professor tells you to watch the people playing basketball on stage uh, watch the basketball and after you watch the whole thing the professor says who saw the man in the ape suit walk through the room all right well I wasn't one of the people who saw that I was I was convinced that it was a lie but then he showed it and you know and so it was this awareness because if you're focused on one thing it just shows you how little your brain can actually process at some level um frankly that's what uh pickpockets do uh they touch you in several different places because above five or six touches and your brain just can't handle the thing so the the sixth touch is them sticking their hand in your pocket and pulling out your wallet right i mean that's it's confusion too confusion yeah. confusing your brain yeah so how many things can you pay attention to at once well that also the flip side of that is how many things can you ignore while you're looking for the anomaly so you would imagine it's a great statement yeah that um that a uh you know uh, a meditator of some kind of high ability can turn off everything except the anomalous information yeah right. you bridged me into I, I love that you even brought up the cannabis <laughs> connection yeah. because i literally my next uh question is about there is research right now, obviously there's a lot, there's tons more research going on about cannabis and just psychedelics in general, let's just say not even cannabis, just, you know, cannabis is, I would say is obviously a mild psychedelic, but looking at all different types of cell psychedelics. Um, Dr. Gull Dolan is a professor of neuroscience at John Hopkins university, and she's looking into using psychedelics that are opening up other neural pathways right now. And then being able to like, yeah, like, so when you were younger, your neural pathways were generally, and again, you know, not a scientist here, yeah. but from what I'm learning and, and watching that opening up neural pathways where you're able to teach yourself, you know, how to play the piano, because when we're kids, we're like little sponges and mm -hmm. we soak up all that information. And then now as an adult, you know, we really close off those pathways for probably many different reasons of, you know, from mental health to you name it to again, just maybe just, you know, from getting older of age, but they're saying that, you know, psychedelics, and I don't recommend people to do psychedelics, just saying this, but in the research context, they're saying that they're opening up these neural pathways. Would this be something that you would look at in your research with the, again, even with experiencers or just in general with the brain, because there might be an interesting connection there that maybe we are able to use psychedelics to open up those neural pathways. So we have those abilities to remote viewer, to do those things and to right. enlarge those areas. Have you thought about bringing, you know, any form of psychedelics research into your own personal research and data collecting? I mean, Yes and no. I mean, the the first part is establishing this database. The the no part of it is not from lack of interest. It's more about lack of money. Um, this is now what you would call a prospective trial rather than a retrospective. Retrospective is basically using data or materials somebody else has already collected. Um, a prospective trial um requires uh ethics committee review what are irbs institutional review boards the money associated with it uh i mean you're, you're literally talking millions of dollars um to do these kinds of studies so the the best way that you can package those studies and that's what we're doing is by aligning them with clear clinical benefit Right. So there are individuals who and I who I know who will function, who will uh, fund these kinds of studies, but you're still best uh, advised to try to align them with a the clinical benefit. And so a clinical benefit would be, you know, people with PTSD, right, who are being used, the psychedelics are being used for them, ketamine. Uh, LSD, psilocybin, I don't know that DMT is being used for that, but maybe it is actually. Um, and so, but what you would do is you would then, part of the study would be, you would have a series of mental ability tests, some of which might include anomalous information tracking. Right. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make it the goal of the study 
because then it could be very easily shot down. But if you have the top 10 things being clearly, you know, uh, you know, does it change your focus? Does it change your ability to do math? You know, all of these things that you might look for as a, a, a benefit or a detriment that you're trying to protect or, or gain. And then this other thing about anomalous information, you could come up with various kinds of, of intuition tests that aren't woo, but touch enough close to it that you would uh, basically say that you're doing those kinds of studies. Uh, so um, I, I think those are the kinds of things that need to be done first. Uh, and again, certainly if somebody wants to drop $10 million on my head, I'll set it up. You know, I, I have the contacts to do it, uh, you know, in the, the clinical side of things and people who want to do it. It's just, it's just the money and time. But, you know, by creating these databases that we're making, um, we're making the ability for anybody to do it, right? I, I, I mean, the, the whole point of science is not to be a lone wolf, but to publish the data and then get it out there in a format that allows other people to use to build their, uh, you know, as a foundation to do next steps, right. and that's really what I'm what I'm trying to do. Um, you know, one individual of outsourcing too, like what you were saying, getting people to submit MRIs and getting right. information back and creating those, you know, privatized databases, which can be right. a little bit scary when you get into privacy issues with like big data and, and right. corporate companies collecting all of that stuff. And then where are they, you know, giving it to when it comes to marketers and, and other things right. get that gets a little scary, but, uh, and get very, very political. But mm -hmm. if we're looking at it just for a medical concept yeah. and, and for it, it, it is, it's so important to our own development, the understanding of our brain and, and who we are as people. I mean, if it's, if it's done with consent, you know, and people sign the necessary forms and, you know, and then the consent forms are not tricky, you know, that's done right. Not like the stuff that we sign every day when we do sign up for social media, we give away more rights than we ever should, I think. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm positive that it's going to be done uh, and I'm ready to participate if people want. Uh, but, I, you know, there's one other um, example of this. There was a, a woman who back in 1962 uh, claimed um, to have these night dreams, night visions. She a, was a famous um, psychic or medium. And in the early 1970s, she did a form of hypnotherapy where she went back and remembered the dreams, you know, more moment by moment. She remembered the dreams, but she was able to give more moment by moment of what it was. And in, in one of those, or a series of the night dream recollections, she basically said that she had been told in these dreams that the caudate and the patamen were the center of intuition and or anomalous cognition and would be the future of it. Okay, now this was at a time when the only thing that the basal ganglia was thought to be involved with was motor control. Right. And I remember as little as like nine, 2005 when I, no, it wouldn't have been 2000, it would have been 2012 or so, when I was speaking with a very well-known psychiatrist at Stanford and talking with him about intuition and, and the basal ganglia. And he was, had been trained at Harvard, and he was an older guy, absolutely determined that the only thing that it was involved with was the basal ganglia, because that's what he'd been taught in school. So here you had a woman, literally a year after I was born, who had intuited a function that we came up with 60 years later, 50 years later, right? And she basically got it right, as far as I can tell. I mean, what we had been speculating, she perfectly aligned with what we were saying. Wow. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 it's not proof of anything yet, but it's so fascinating. I can't help myself to continue to go down the rabbit hole, if you will, and prove or disprove it. And so, so far, the real studies that we've done have supported the original findings, 
right? And those are peer reviewed, mm -hmm. published. Yeah. So I don't know many other people out there who are doing this, right? That are, that are really taking the time to do it properly based on their intuition, right? right. We intuited the center of intuition and it turns out others had gotten there before us, uh, but we were right. It's unbelievable. I have to move into a section though, that I, I'm, I'm super curious to know what you think, because it's obviously so current with us in looking at the political state of UAPs. Mm -hmm. I have a few questions around this and looking at, um, right now we see that we're getting into, I'm thinking that UFOs are starting to become more political before, you know, we obviously had a bipartisan where now we've had both sides, Republican and Democrats looking at this and, you know, really championing together to get, you know, the, the truth forward coming from the U S government or anybody else, private into uh, private companies, you name it, right. We want a form of, I don't really like the word disclosure, but we'll use it, uh, the form of disclosure. Do you think that it's really political now? And do you think that this political movement is going to start moving into more Republican and it's going to start moving to the right wing uh, of politics right now? I mean, I think, uh, well, let's look at what um, I think uh, Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo did brilliantly, which was they used the scare factor of uh, what UFOs might represent in terms of a national security threat uh, to, you know, in terms of like, is the Russians or the Chinese uh, to basically get people to pay attention on the Hill uh, to motivate people's attention. And, uh, you know, that ended up largely being a bipartisan thing, but you know, and, and I haven't done it statistically, but uh, most of the interactions that I've had now with the, um, with the government uh, have been through uh, Republican, uh, the Republican side. I wouldn't call them right wing. I mean, they're Republican, uh, you know, and I, and, you know, for better or, or worse, we need to thank um, Tucker Carlson uh, you know, despite some of the other things that people don't like about him, and I'm not in, you know, I, I'm not in favor either. Uh, he was a gentleman to me uh, and has pushed this uh, subject matter forward. Um, so, you know, people have said to me, well, why did you even go on his show? What, what are you doing? You know, uh, et cetera. Uh, Fox hates people like you. Um, and, uh, I said, well, you know, um, yeah, I could ignore him, uh, or not go, uh, or I could use it as an opportunity, uh, to move the whole thing forward. Um, because who would you rather have me or some loon, or maybe I am a loon, I don't know. Um, so, uh, and I think the left wing, if you will, if we're going to call it right and left, right. The, the Democrats are so afraid of their own shadow often that they're afraid of being accused of something. I think the people who are more on the, on the right side of the spectrum, to the extent that they see either opportunity or a, a military um, opportunity, uh, they're just more clear-eyed about it. Uh, so, but I think this is, you know, back to your term, this is neurodiversity. It, you know, I think we need multiple views as long as they're not extreme. Part is we're looking at, you know, Robert Bigelow has invested over 50 million right now into multiple different Republican parties and Ron DeSantos is being one of them, right? You know, investing 10 million into him. So the question then is now, do we move forward and the Republicans are going to use this, the UAP topic as part of their platform in the next elections? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's really scary. You know, yeah. isn't this supposed to be a bipartisan and a topic for everybody? And then if we get it using it as a political play, that, that can be very dangerous. And it doesn't mean if it's Democratic or Republican, it could be right. anything. This well, topic is supposed to be for everyone. It's not supposed to be for a political party. Well, then I, I think it is um, 
incumbent then on the people who are, let's say, on the other side of the spectrum to see what is successful and what works. I mean, if if you're a left wing blogger or a ref, left wing UFO Twitter person, then don't blame the Republicans for paying attention to something that's important that you think are important. Blame the Democrats and get off your ass and write the Democrats. Make it an issue. Um, you know, it's, I, I don't blame anybody for taking advantage of it, as long as it's not being used to beat down the other group. Uh, but um, so, I, I don't know, I, I don't yet see it as a problem. Um, what I would see it as a problem is if it becomes some sort of QAnon related, you know, uh, conspiracy add on that just you know, turns it into a clown act. Um, We've seen that, though. We've seen Trump speak to UFOs and QAnon in the past. And we've you and QAnon has referenced the UFO uh, community and topic in part of their own platform. So that really is the fear is when you have people that are obviously, you know, farring in far alt right and looking at the right wing politics as well, let's just say, and, fo and are following certain people within, you know, a political parties, maybe obviously not all different, you know, uh, politicians, but some it's going to cause hate. And then what happens is then the UFO community becomes part of this alt-right discussion, which instantly then media, well, some media will yeah. decide not to take seriously anymore and discredit the community. And that really is the fear that we might see that happening if this becomes ultrally political and, you know, extremist groups that are politically adjacent attach themselves to it. I mean, in the bigger picture, uh, it might be just a, uh you know, a feedback mechanism that society, you know, uses to moderate uh, outcomes. Um, I'm more positive about it, that th those sorts of things that you're talking about will happen. Uh, you know, fear spreads faster than hope. Um, and so I, I'm, I can't worry about that. But the people who I do know who are sane on the inside, see it in a clear-eyed manner and uh, don't let those other things get in the way. I mean, we'll see, time will tell. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, I, you know, the things that I know that are going on inside could be stopped by, it's, it's, it's not the people I know that worry me. It's the people that I know exist that are trying to stop this and how they are manipulating the situation behind the scenes. Maybe they're using the QAnon types or all the rest or feeding them. Uh, so, you know, the, the best thing we can hope is just keep pushing. It's at a greater level of awareness than it's ever been. Uh, there are steps being taken. Um, in the meantime, you know, maybe we just don't wait for the government to tell us what to do. I mean, I've always said this, frankly, is that if you're going to wait for daddy to tell you that something you know is right, then, you know, then you're basically, you gave up control to daddy or mommy. Yeah. And um, so what I know, I know. I mean, I know what I saw. So I don't need anybody to tell me what it is that I saw. Um, but that anecdote of me seeing something is more than enough for me to believe it. Uh, but to convince a scientist, it's a different language of proof which is required so that um, it can be independently measured or I can create data that they can look at and agree with me is proof of something anomalous. So, you know, we, we have to think about the, the people that we're trying to convince uh, if you've seen something, you don't need anybody to tell you that it, it's real. You know, you only need somebody to tell you what it is, what it means. Right. right. And at a simple level, you can make, basically take the assumption that we're not alone. Right. But what it means and what they're doing, what the intent and agenda, et cetera, is, I mean, then you can spin into all kinds of speculation that, you know, basically are, are unprovable. Right. Uh, 
But then on the other hand, you know, there are, there's a group of society which hasn't seen anything. They might like crazy Uncle Gary, uh, but they don't necessarily believe the stories that he tells or they don't know what it means. They look to scientists or the government who is basically looking at scientists to tell them what the meaning is. And so from my point of view, the people to convince are the scientists. So mm -hmm. then the, I'm not going to convince them with another story. I'm not going to convince them with another movie. I'm, I, I'm not going to convince them over drinks. I'm going to convince them with data. So what kind of data? Material data. Uh, so I go after materials, you know, hard materials that can be collected in the field with, you know, with evidence, something that I can do the analysis and then hand it over to somebody else. Um, or the MRI images of people who've been claimed to interact with with right which is hard data that somebody else can can i can handle now the, the other point the bigger point that i've been making is it's the data you need to convince people is real not the conclusion i can give you data and say here's data of something moving from here to here and here to here and here you know faster than anything we know should but i'm not going to claim that it's reptilians from the Pleiades or the space brothers from Alpha Centauri. Exactly. The, right. Because those are all obviously disprovable crap. Well, so, and how do you prove that? You know, and, it's and you yeah. can't. exactly, or exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it, convincing someone that the data is real puts you in a different position. You now get to be the person who is not being asked the question of what it is, you can now ask them, what do you think it is? You speculate, don't shoot down everything I'm thinking, come up with something of your own. And I found that, I mean, that trick, if you will, is what usually sets the scientists that I know uh, back on their heels when they're like, okay, well, yeah, that's unusual. And data speaks volumes. Data is, you know, yeah. data is king in that. And I would agree. The whole concept now, when we'll get into, and this is kind of my last section of this, is obviously craft retrievals. You know, you've been analyzing so much data with Jack Valet, you know, over the years and have been working with him. Now, this the whole crash retrieval thing, we're looking at potentially maybe next year you know, here, here's hoping, and maybe, you know, and you can tell me <laughs> is next year or coming years that whistleblowers are obviously coming forward and are going to say that, you know, are going to testify and are going to say that they've have obviously touched it or have experienced it. You know, where are you with that in your data? Is there any other new data that you're, that you're analyzing? And do, do you know who these whistleblowers are? And can you name some to me? <laughs> if not, if you will um, or not. I mean, and are, and will this happen potentially next year? I'm going to be very careful because I got in trouble um, for even saying some of the things I've said. Uh, but um, so first, let's talk about the whistleblower law and what right. it really says. It doesn't say they can come forward and talk on 60 Minutes. Right. It says that they can come forward and uh, tell people in Congress what it is that they've seen. Now, that doesn't mean that Congress can then turn around and talk about it publicly. In fact, they probably won't. Um, I mean, Burchett and others have already seen the private briefings, and Burchett, to the extent that he said anything, has come out and said, um, this was technology. It was clearly a disc. It wasn't a balloon. It wasn't a seagull. It wasn't half a dozen other things that people claim, not swamp gas, et cetera. Uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a Chinese drone, you know, um, whatever the latest excuses that they seem to be throwing out. Um, so I think, yes, it'll come forward internally, whether it sees the light of day is another another point and and i mean the long and the short of it is there are people who know 
for sure. Uh, and so, um, I, I just, I just shouldn't say anymore. Cause I, I, well, I, there's conversations I'm hearing of people gathering whistleblowers right now. Like I'm hearing that and there, and I'm obviously not going to say specifics in my own space because there are, you know, kind of lots of hearsay of things that you hear. And obviously you need evidence and proof and let those people come forward, but they're gathering them right now. Um, and well, so I, I don't, the, yeah. I, I Do you know what question. areas these people might be coming from though? If it's either like, if it's, if it's, let's say pilots, if it's just, if it's government, is it, you know, or is it politicians? Like who are, are these people? Have you heard in what areas um, of just, culture I, are they coming just, from? What spectrum of culture? Broadly speaking, government. Okay. I think that's probably, I, I can't, I can't get in trouble for saying that, but um, the probably still will get in trouble. I get in trouble all the time. Um, so, uh, but, but I mean, you know, I, I just moving the ball forward internally is not the same as moving the ball forward publicly. Internally, everybody knows that there's something here, right? That there's some something from somewhere is here. Uh, but how do we get that information out publicly is a difficult thing because, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost the same kind of problem. We know something's here, but we don't know actually what it is because all of the things that you could think that it is humanoid aliens with red eyes and all this stuff it's ridiculous to think that you would have a species that would basically look so human-like uh, i mean there's no reason it should evolve the same form there's just right. and so you have to think in a more jacques ballet way that these things are almost in a way conscious puppets, right? Created to not fool us, but to interact with us because whatever it is that actually created them is not understandable to us. And so these are placeholders, uh, interaction icons, uh, you know, in a more advanced way. Uh, and because I just, as an evolutionary biologist and geneticist, I have a hard time um, connecting with this notion that these things are humanoid in, in any way. That even vaguely they would look human. There's, I mean, you know, you a rutabaga could just as easily become intelligent on another planet <laughs> as a human. <laughs> um that <laughs> that's that that's well i hope that doesn't happen with the rutabagas it would be scary to see <laughs> you know but something that was shaped like a rutabaga you know what i mean it's it's there's just nothing special about the human form that you know belies intelligence or uh it just it's it's so narcissistic of us as a species to think that this shape is the only thing that could house intelligence for sure um and so you know, I think that I think that's the problem is that even if you were to find the bodies in the refrigerator somewhere, I mean, it's evidence that it's something, but I don't think that it's evidence that that is what's behind the scenes. And I think that's part of what scares the people who do know um, that it's it's that it's that problem of knowing something isn't real and that it's more complex and you can't come up with a single consolidated story that covers the entire area and therefore nobody can really say what it is because it seems to be many things and if it is many things then it's the problem is even more complex than you could imagine uh For sure. oh. that you know that uh you know let's say that there are eight different groups of whatever they are and they don't all necessarily agree with each other and we're not the main show we're a sideshow uh but somehow maybe some of them see us as a resource 
or some of us see us as something to be protected from others who see us as a resource. And so, you know, you could have a little bit of that going on. You also bring up like people trying to stop this conversation. I've heard this from Travis Taylor. You know, I've heard this from Lou Elizondo. I've heard this from multiple people, right? Christopher Mellon, like, you know, everyone is saying that there are people within government that yeah. don't want this to come forward. I have to ask this question because, you know, and, and it's maybe high conspiracy, but, you know, do you think it's the Collins elite? Like, is this, is that, you know, that's always been played around. And I, I know I'm not going to obviously say certain people, but there's people, I would say probably from, you know, task force that have worked at ATIP and other things have had these conversations. Yeah. So do you, do you think it's the Collins elite that is part of this? I think that the religious uh, element is part of it. Um, you know, whether it's the Collins elite or some, let's say, loosely affiliated group, uh, there's a religious component to it. Um, certainly, and uh, are people uh, of a religious inclination. Uh, now, whether it's because it's religion or because they're more paranoid as a group, not because they're religious, but just that particular group is more paranoid or, or sees the power associated with understanding this stuff first, they see it as a way to leverage control. I don't know. Or if they gave that control to somebody else, that somebody else would then have the control. I mean, the long and the short of it is whatever the technology is, it's certainly not being used uh, in the military at a high level. So either somebody's using it and trying to understand it, and maybe they've developed some understanding of it, or they're so afraid that if the rest of the world would have it, it would lessen their own power. I mean, that's one way to, to think about it. And so they just won't give it out because they're afraid if someone like me got a hold of it, I'd show how it works and, you know, give it to everybody. I mean, not that I would. I mean, I'm under my own agreements. And I would use it for national security first. I mean, I'm just going to be honest to people out there. People are going to hurry be all over Twitter, you know, in 15 minutes after this thing comes out and says, you know, Gary's going to, you know, Gary's not for us. I am. But I also understand that you have there's a system within which to work, because um, you know if you're if you're going to agree to help, uh, and you're going to swear an oath, um, it, then you're going to do what it is you said you do. And I'm I'm for better or worse, that's the kind of person that I'm I I am. But I'm always going to push for letting some aspect of it out. Um, so that the public can benefit, even if we don't know what it is. I mean, Corso, the book by Corso is an example of that, that whatever understanding they could have of it, they did find a way to let it out. Um, but I think there's, you know, the, the, the other issue is letting people know that it is, it is real uh, immediately, creates a journalistic tar trap, tar pit, that people will, you know, ask the right questions. Why did you hide it? Who did you hurt? Because you hid it. For and sure, so what sure. kind of amnesty can you give these people? Uh, you probably can, but you, you could give them amnesty. That's not going to start a thousand court cases. It's not going to stop, I should say, a thousand court cases. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, you're going to ruin the lives of the people who were involved, whether you've given them amnesty or not. And so they are smart enough to realize that. Uh, and so, um, you know, maybe we have to wait until they die off. <laughs> Jeez. And that, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's, you know, that's a, that's unfortunate. And then we look at this drip mechanism then that's coming in through that we see, um, I'll say it's drip. And I think a lot of people have is referred to the UAP topic. They're slowly dripping it to us. You know, they're slowly giving, um, you know, the word again, disclosure, uh, because maybe for reasons like that, you know, Yeah, I don't think, I don't think that there's like some checklist internally. I think you have these internal factions fighting each other. And those who can get a hold of whatever information they can and feel that it's 
possible for them to let it out, they, they do, or they leak it out. So the disclosure, to the extent that there is a program of disclosure, is not because there's a hidden checklist that somebody has behind the scenes and they're saying, okay, let it out. I think it's because of the of the conflict going on behind the scenes. The I, I think the forces of, let's say, uh, non-disclosure uh, have rallied uh, and uh, have basically pushed back hard, which is why there's things have slowed down a little bit. Um, and uh, you know, where's the UAP task force report? Yeah, it's so true. Where is it? And, and so yeah. that's that's frankly because there's a fight behind the scenes as to what can be said in it and, sure. and that's just, and that's just the that's just the uap task force report that goes to congress that's not even the one that might be made public well, and i don't heard it's gone to congress already it's now what it's going to come out to us how are they publicly going to publicly going to, it, to, to, to congress it? That's you, what I've heard. I've heard okay. that it's gone to Congress. I've heard that that report has gone to Congress. Congress has it. Again, I'm not 100% sure. This is just what I've heard. This is hearsay that it's gone to Congress, but it, the report hasn't come out of what they're publicly going to tell us yet. That hasn't been done yet. Well, obviously, we don't have it, but that line. hasn't, I don't know if it's been written. It's I don't know. Be, it's <laughs> going to be like the word the and then signed by, you know, black strip. <laughs> Okay, a hundred. That's that's you know. Well, and 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 things I always say to you. The reason why I don't like always using the word disclosure, and I know we use it as a buzzword, but I feel that disclosure is ever going to be happening, right? Like it's always we're never going to stop it. You know, one thing we're going to want to know, we might not believe it. Let's be honest, is is what we don't usually believe things that come out now, and a lot of people don't. They don't even a lot of people don't even follow the UAP topic. But as let's say we have a form of disclosure, there's going to be something next and next and next. It's never going to stop. We're always going to have questions. So you're never fully going to get full disclosure because it will open up a floodgate of other things. Well, so I think it's ever evolving, right? I'm involved in two things uh, to help. One is setting up an analytical framework for materials that is like no other. So, you know, for instance, people, I mean, people offer me stuff they find all over the planet that they claim is this or that. And to the extent that any of it is, has a, a decent chain of evidence and isn't, you know, just a rock that somebody found on a beach, um, which I get a, a few of offers, uh, is, um, you know, so for instance, these metal spheres uh, of Ross Colhart. Right. I, was, I had, I was going to ask you about that because there's so much online controversy and I hate bringing up UFO Twitter for not that I, I love UFO Twitter because I love that there's conversation in the space, but I hate just the gossip that's in that community, yes. but I have I mean, to bring it up because they're saying, why isn't it, why isn't, why isn't uh, Gary come out with the, 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 hasn't analyzed yet. Why isn't that? What's going on with the sphere? Here's the, yeah. here's the reason why it's um, so first of all, Ross had no control over what the what the uh, advertisers did for his show. I mean, so anybody who thinks that, you know, he was the one who's who wrote all the headlines. It's like, you know, this you write an article and the the news, the people behind the scenes write the, the headline. And, you know, you don't have much say about what the headline is um, from your own article. Uh, same thing for for Ross. Uh, so, yeah. He's giving me materials and I have, a, I have a bunch of other materials, but a one-off analysis done just on that material. So what are you going to get? It's got iron. It's got a few other things in it and maybe some carbon, nickel. Okay, so what? It has to be run with controls. There's about five other things that could be done afterwards. Um, so rather than with the 50 literally things that I've got doing these little one-off experiments, each of which is expensive and each of which is time consuming, I have to ask one of my postdocs or grad students to do it in their off hours. And then I have to work on the data because I can't ask them to process the data. Um, and then what am I gonna do? Post it on Twitter? No. 
what I want to do is take a whole bunch of these materials, have an analytical pipeline and framework, run all of them at once so that they're all run at the same time under the same conditions, et cetera, with enough left over that I could hand to anybody else who wants to do it as well, and then publish a paper on it. So I'm sorry to the people who are so frigging impatient that they won't get off their butt and go learn the stuff and do it themselves. I'm not your daddy. I'm not here to do things for you. I'm sorry. Get out of your basement and go do something. In the meantime, I'm collecting the stuff and I'm preparing that pipeline so that not only will I be able to do that, but should anybody on the inside think that I have something valuable, they can come to me. Now, why would they do that? Because they already have. Because they've already come to me with some of their results. And, I'm, and I basically said, these results are shit. Sorry, I'm just going to be clear. This is shoddy work. This could, this can't go anywhere. Who did this? It's crap. All right. That's a hundred percent fair. Yeah. So, so that's the reason, and this is expensive. I mean, let's just run the numbers. The equipment that would be required to do a full A to Z easily to buy the instruments retail or whatever. 50, 60 million dollars to buy all the kinds of instruments that you require to set up a, a laboratory. Now you have to people that laboratory with experts with each of those machines. Some of these machines are like a lifetime work to understand how to run them. All right. So now you've got, let's say, five, six technicians at, you know, we call them an FTE of, you know, salary and benefits, $200,000 and, you know, running costs. You got 10 of them, uh, that's two or $3 million a year. And then, and then, you know, managing costs for the instruments is probably another million dollars a year for warranties and all that kind of stuff. I know that because I'm running my own lab and that's basically what it costs to run my lab. My lab runs at about three to $4 million a year. That's what I, I spend my off hours writing grants and begging charities for, for money to keep it running. Um, and so for all the people on Twitter who think that this is just something you snap your fingers and do, go ahead. I've seen some of those snap your fingers reports and they're garbage. Yeah, Both we don't people, want garbage. We, we don't, don't want garbage. Want it's going proper to be data. Used, yeah. It's going to be used by the naysayers and they're going to pick it apart. I mean, even the beautiful study that we did on the Atacama uh, skeleton, the DNA study we did, showing that it was human and showing it had uh, bone morphology genes. I had world's expert geneticists on South American genetics and uh, the world's expert in bone disorder genes here at Stanford, both of them being at Stanford. I did that, 12, 15 people on the paper, Roche, Roche sequencing uh you know experts in bioinformatician etc we all did it everything was double clip i'm still a cia plant that you know was uh, was bought off by a grant from the dad for ovarian research you know three million dollars i get bought off i mean how, how i didn't even analyze the data my students did so i didn't get bought off you're accusing the students of being bought off and yeah. a, a conspiracy so this is what happens. So even in the best of, and so one of the things I learned on that is that because I wrote an email to Stephen Greer saying in the early days, I think there might be something here. I learned later that it was garbage, that, that, that the data that I thought was anomalous was just garbage. It wasn't garbage. It was just, there's a way to process the data that I hadn't done. I wasn't aware of, um, but that didn't stop. But because he wanted it to be about an alien. It didn't fit his narrative. So therefore he claims I'm a fraud. Well, my answer is with science is now he claims that he has a piece of the bone. So go, and he says that there are experts who say that I'm wrong. Publish the darn paper. Stop claiming that. If you don't think that I'm right, publish a paper and prove I'm wrong. That's yeah, what science is about. I can be wrong. If you publish the paper until then you're full of shit. 
Right. A hundred percent. And Stephen Greer is his, <laughs> it's his, his own, own bag his own. of worms. But, sure. but, but yeah. it's, but it's indicative of a kind of, of a kind of person that does this, but it, but it, it taught me a lesson is that you don't do science by press release. You don't do it by Twitter. You, 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 you do it by publishing it in a peer reviewed paper, which right. is the standard by which other people can look at the data and say whether or not what you did was right. Um, and if to the extent that the original material that created the data is shareable, which this body is, and people claim now to have pe that they ha kept a piece of it, fine, go reanalyze it. That's what you do. That's what science is. Um, and so for all the people who wonder whether or not I'm going to do anything with it, the short answer, and I told this to Ross and he knows it, is no, not until I have the analytical framework set up to do it. Thank you for clearing that up. I appreciate that because yeah. I know people would have been harping on me as well if I didn't ask at I, least to right to ask the question uh, because it, it obviously makes sense if there are materials that are being analyzed it's like just give give the respect to the scientist and give respect to the person that's working on this and give respect to anybody in this space even if it's Ross and yourself that they give the time to analyze it and obviously it is expensive so and I appreciate where you where would you that. publish where would you publish a paper on a few slivers of an item that could be basically a garden ornament for all we know. Right. And so it is the only data that you would get from that that is worthy of public, is worthy of anything is it's sufficiently anomalous. And now you take, or whether it is or not, now you take that object and you go do x-rays of it and all the, all the rest. Um, but again, that's expensive. Um, you know, someone's going to, somebody has to do it and shepherd the thing through all of those processes. And until you have it, it done, I mean, it's, it's, it's worthless. The data is just, would then just sit in isolation is not comparable to anything. I would rather publish a paper on 10 materials, each of which has a decent story behind it. And here's the uh, analytics that we did, the different instruments, et cetera, that we could rent. I'm not going to buy $50 million worth of instruments. There's a couple of laboratories I know that have these and I can pay to have the relevant experts do it. Um, but it's still expensive. Uh, so if the, the next person who claims that they, you know, that I'm not doing it, start me a GoFundMe and, uh, you know, and we'll do it. Otherwise, you know, you're wasting your breath. I a hundred percent. Thank Sorry you. So no, no, I, I think I'm so happy that you said that because you have to say your piece before the fact that people have asked this question and it clears it up now. And if they have more questions, oh it'll be I'll get it. I'll get it. The, and I, I appreciate you you clearing it up again. Sorry. Thank you so much, Gary. I appreciate you taking the time with me. And as I say to all my guests, thank you so much for being rebelliously curious. Yeah. Thanks. It's fun. Thank you.